Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a long speech, <laughs> the, 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 the longest I've written as a chairman of the ISB. So I'm not sure if it's going to be core or more. But <laughs> uh, I, I would like to, um, to thank uh, Accountancy Europe uh, for this uh, opportunity to uh, deliver a speech on the uh, future of corporate uh, reporting. Um, your core and more report from uh, 2015 uh, was a thought-provoking and uh, well-researched document of the future of uh, broader reporting. Uh, and it has really helped me uh, to shape my thoughts uh, on the challenges that the IASB and the broader reporting community are facing. And today I would like to share my uh, thoughts, which are still developing uh, by the day almost, uh, to share my thoughts with you. And I would like to start with a very concrete example that demonstrates that the financial statements of a company are not the source of all wisdom for investors. So ever since going public in the year 2010, the car manufacturer Tesla has been losing money. It has burned through $7 billion of cash. Investors, in the meantime, have experienced dilution after dilution of their shares. Yet the market value of these shares has reached a whopping, I have written down 50 billion, I believe it's already 70 billion in the meantime. Tesla overtook the market value of General Motors, even though GM sells more than 100 times as many cars as Tesla and does so profitably. So these remarkable uh, data uh, demonstrate that investors do not just look at the reported profit and the balance sheet to guide their investment decisions. And clearly, uh, investors nurture very high hopes for the future of Tesla. And they base these hopes on the company's intangibles, its technological prowess and its business model that combines the production of electrical cars with batteries. And these intangibles are not captured in the balance sheet. So in the case of Tesla, the numbers in the financial statements probably pay, play a limited role in the current market valuation of the company. Now, Tesla is probably an extreme case, but it highlights a trend towards a widening gap between book values and the market values of companies. And given the increasing role of technology and intangible platforms in the global economy, this may not be so surprising. But what does it mean for the relevance of financial reporting? And there is more going on in the world of reporting. Companies are providing more and more non-financial information, mainly on environmental, social and government's ESG issues. And they are seeking a wider audience than investors alone. And another widely observed trend is the increasing availability of digital data and the, the so-called big data and the emergence of artificial intelligence to mine these big, big heaps of data. So these developments create a lot of opportunities, but they also create uh, confusion and anxiety. With all this information being requested and provided, will we still be able to see the woods for the trees? And isn't the widely perceived problem of information and disclosure overload just becoming bigger and bigger? Isn't financial reporting in the classical sense becoming less and less relevant? And what does the future hold for the accounting standard setters and indeed for the accounting profession as a whole? Now, my first answer to all these questions is that we should keep calm and carry on. <laughs> I am not at all concerned that the relevance of financial reporting is under threat. First, for the very fact that financial reporting is primarily, but as you know, not exclusively, but primarily backward looking, it offers the most concrete evidence of the performance of a company. For mature companies, the income statement is the hardest and most comparable source of information for investors. 
it does not just have confirmative, confirmatory value. It is also a vital starting point for any projections of future cash flows. That is the case now, and I am sure it will still be the case 10 years from now. Also, the financial statements will always remain an important reality check. During the dot-com bubble at the beginning of the century, the increasingly absurd price-earnings ratios of internet startups, often price-no-earning ratios, uh, served to feed healthy skepticism that later turned out to be justified. And these days, similar concerns are arising about the valuations of the Silicon Valley tech giants, and short sellers are getting more aggressive by the day. Ultimately, all value creation has to pass through the financial statements. And if it takes too long, the income statement will indicate that the intangibles of a company may have evaporated into thin air, possibly in some cases on the tra trajectory to the planet Mars. Second, the more in information becomes available, the more need there is for comparability, standardization, and quality control. Accounting standards aim to achieve this based on sound economic principles. And just think about the current diversity in accounting practices for insurance activities. No artificial intelligence in the world would be able to make heads or tails from, informations that, from information that is in many cases inherently flawed. And this is why I do not see the advent of big data and artificial intelligence as a challenge to the relevance of accounting standards. They can provide useful supplemental information, certainly in terms of speediness, but they will not replace the financial statements. For all these reasons, <clears throat> I am confident that the financial statements will remain a vital anchor for investors in their evaluation of a company. And while this conclusion might provide some relief in this room, we must beware of comp complacency. The times, they are a changing, and we all need to adapt, including the IASB. The first thing that the ISB needs to do is to strengthen the relevance of financial reporting itself. And as most of you know, the central theme of our current agenda is better communication in financial reporting. The better communication agenda aims to improve the communication effectiveness of the financial statements. We are continuing our work on disclosures, providing guidance on making materiality judgments, and developing general principles for disclosure. And this should help companies to remove clutter and to, to make their disclosures more meaningful. The central part of the better communication theme will be to take a fresh look at the primary financial statements, what we call performance reporting. Investors want more disaggregation, additional line items, and possibly subtotals that tell more about the performance of a company. We will have to provide more and better structure to the income statement and to the cash flow statement. And the results should be better formatted primary statements that provide better information without investors having to dig into endless pages of notes disclosures. Better formatting of the primary statements should also facilitate digital reporting. And that brings me to the third element of better communication, which looks at the changing nature of the consumption of financial information. Increasingly, investors are using electronic means to digest financial information. Already more than 60% of financial information is consumed electronically. Often this information is produced by data aggregators. <laughs> And to enhance the quality of electronically provided data, it is imperative that the IFRS Foundation continues to, to develop its IFRS taxonomy. The IFRS taxonomy is already used by a wide variety of market participants and regulators, and it is on the verge of making a new quantum leap. The SEC has uh, recently mandated the IFRS taxonomy for the filing of company reports by foreign private ins issuers. ESMA is looking to do the same in Europe, and a proposition 
that seems to be a proposition that is broadly supported by influential ESMA stakeholders. I think these developments can do a lot to improve the accessibility of digital in financial information to investors. And in addition, it can contribute to improving the quality of IFRS formation in the data provided by, for example, the data aggregators. And in turn, once regulatory filings become digitized, this will open a wealth of information about how IFRS standards are actually used in practice. And the feedback from regulatory filings might inform us as the IASB on the formatting decisions we need to take in our project to improve the primary financial statements. A fourth step that the ISB may need to take is to give pre preparers more guidance on how to provide context to their financial statements. And this should enable the companies to better explain their strategy for long-term value creation. The ISB has always been aware that financial reporting in the narrow sense has its limitations. In our conceptual framework, we acknowledge that general purpose financial reports are not, to designed, are not designed to show the value of a company and that users also need other sources of information to make their valuations. And our awareness of the limitations of financial reporting in the narrow sense is one of the reasons that the ISB issued its non-mandatory management commentary practice statement in 2010. This practice statement encourages management to provide context to the financial statements. It encourages management to report on the nature of the business, on its objectives, its strategies, critical financial and non-financial resources, principal strategic, commercial, operational, and financial risks, performance indicators, and information about the company's projects, prospects, forward-looking information. Essentially, our uh, management commentary practice statement was an early foray of the ISB into integrated reporting. Because all the elements of information it mentions are important components of integrated reporting. The management commentary enables a company to explain its strategy for long-term value creation, which is the essence of the international integrated reporting framework. The management commentary is also a good platform for companies to describe and explain the intangibles that are uh, essential to their business model. The capital markets need information on how intangible resources are being managed in the, company, in the context of a company's strategy. However, measurement and outcome uncertainty of, sorry, <clears throat> however, measurement and outcome uncertainty of intangibles are and will remain formidable obstacles for any efforts to quantify them reliably. Even when intangibles have undeniable value, their existence can be ephemeral. Just think about the fate of some mobile phone companies in the recent past, one in Finland, one in Canada. Their seemingly unassailable, unassailable technologies were destroyed almost overnight. And for these reasons, the narrative of corporate reports, rather than a financial statements, will most likely remain the best place to deal with uh, intangibles. Since the publication of our co management commentary in 2010, the world has moved on. There is an increasing interest in integrated reporting with its focus on long-term value creation and with a greater emphasis on connectivity, for example, on how external developments affect a company's strategy. Several important documents have been produced that have further developed thinking on integrated reporting and I would like uh, to mention the strategic report guidance by the Financial Reporting Council in the United Kingdom and, of course, the IR framework. It is also clear that there is an increasing awareness that env environmental and societal restrictions have an impact on long-term value creation. The establishment by the Financial Stability Board of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures is a notable example of this trend. Our management commentary practice statement is completely silent on all these issues. 
So these are all reasons why the ISB is currently looking at the question of whether we should take on a project to update the management commentary practice statement to reflect these new developments. And I think there are clear reasons to do so. And we are especially well placed to make sure that there is a good fit and connectivity between the financial reports and the non-financial information. Actually, you know, a lot of the issues that I just mentioned are really financial information, except that they are not in the financial statements, but it is broader financial information. It has all, everything that has an impact on the value of a company is basically financial information. And I believe that this connectivity between uh, this, this difference elements with the financial reports is essential to the success of integrated reporting. I now come to the uh, last part of my speech, which will be devoted to environmental, social, and governance, so-called ESG reporting. And in the remainder of my speech, I will also refer to ESG as uh, sustainability reporting, as that seems to be common practice in the market, although I appreciate there are varying definitions of both ESG and sustainability reporting, but I'm going to be imprecise and use both. The Core and More uh, report sketches how sustainability reporting has grown exponentially in recent years. And indeed, most of the volume expansion of annual reports is due to extended ESG reporting and in a much more limited way due to IFRS. About one third of sustainability reporting instruments are voluntary, while roughly two thirds are mandated by mostly national public authorities. The audience for sustainability reporting is broader than that of financial reporting. It can even encompass a society at large. ESG standards encompass a big variety of areas from human rights, gender diversity, to uh, working conditions, to highly technical matters such as the emission of greenhouse gases and pollutants. Different from financial and integrated reporting, much, but not all, but much of sustainability reporting is primarily focused on the external effects of the performance of a company. It aims to report on the value created or destroyed by a company to collective goods like the environment or social well-being. ESG reporting requirements often aim to entice corporations to act responsibly and to take broader public goods into account. ESG reporting can be even directly linked to public policy. For an emissions rights trading scheme, for example, reliable carbon reporting is essential. The Core and More report rightly notes that the world of sustainability reporting does not provide the same kind of global comparability that exists in the world of financial reporting. And the report calls for decisive leadership to establish an international standard setter and even poses the question if the ISB as renowned international standard setter, thank you for that compliment, should provide at least, <laughs> should at least, Welcome. should provide at least part of that leadership. Now I have to take a deep swig. <laughs> <laughs> but water doesn't really help. So, so what, so what is it that the ISB can do? Let me first note that despite the differences in focus and remit, the world of financial and ESG reporting are not completely separate. A number of organizations, notably the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, SASB, and the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, develop their standards specifically to address investors' needs in their uh, valuation purposes. And due to growing investor sensitivity around social responsibility and environmental sustainability, these issues have a growing impact on the future profitability and valuation of a company. And to the extent that this is the case, management commentary or an integrated report should take these factors into account. And this is something that the ISB has to take on board in updating our uh, MCPS, our management commentary. Secondly, the ISB is a member of the Corporate Reporting Dialogue, currently chaired by my friend and former colleague Ian uh, McIntosh, which seeks to improve cooperation and harmonization between its members. And a concrete and very promising initiative of the CRD is a project to align the climate-related metrics of its member organizations 
the CDP, the, Sustainab the SESB, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. And I'm sure that Ian will later on tell a little bit more about that. Nevertheless, I do not think that the ISB is equipped to enter the field of sustainability reporting directly. Our focus on financial reporting for capital market participants is deeply embedded in our DNA. Widening the audience and scope of our work would most likely lead to loss of focus and identity. Moreover, our main area of competence is economics. ESG reporting to wider stakeholder groups requires expertise that we simply do not have. If we want to create more clarity in the somewhat chaotic world of wider corporate reporting, we all need to, to define clearly what our responsibilities and competences are. If we all try to do everything, the most likely outcome is that, that, that nothing gets done properly. So if not primarily the ISB, who then should take responsibility for harmonization of ESG requirements and trying to prevent overload? Well, I believe that since so much of ESG reporting is so closely intertwined with public policy goals, I believe that public authorities are best equipped to pursue harmonization. It took bold action by the European Union to make IFRS into an international standard. And given the even bigger political sensitivity of sustainability reporting, determined political action in this field is even more important. Yet I have to admit immediately that achieving this will be very challenging. ESG reporting um, is, it's, it's, is more diverse than financial reporting and has a much more varied group of stakeholders, even among public authorities. Its understandable political sensitivity is not going to make things easier. In sum, the road to international harmonization is likely to be long, windy, winding and rocky. As a start, it would be wise for public authorities not to keep on adding to the diversity and possible overload of ESG reporting requirements. Stacking requirement upon requirement leads to a rapidly declining marginal effect. And it would also be wise not to foster unrealistic expectations of ESG reporting as a change agent. ESG reporting is good, but direct public policy action is often better and certainly more effective. And let me give you just a couple of examples. In their sustainability reports, soft drinks producers are very keen to show how they try to motivate their, must, their customers to reduce their sugar intake and to pursue a more lively and active lifestyle. Yet this does not stop the same companies from lobbying actively against the imposition of a sugar tax which would be likely much more effective um, than a sustainability report by um, uh, these companies. And sometimes ESG reporting is heavier on PR than on substance. And another example that comes to my mind is that of a grocery chain in, uh, uh, close to where I live that I know is genuinely committed to sustainability reporting. But despite this commitment, its plastic shopping bags have burdened the environment for many years. They were all over the place. And all it took was a very simple political decision to charge, to force all these companies to charge five cents on every plastic bag. And immediately, and I saw it happen personally, its consumption, the consumption of these bags was reduced by 85%. So simple and so effective. And finally, the Great Barrier Reef, it's already half dead and it will be completely dead in 15 years. And it is good that the G20 asked the FSB to do something about climate disclosures. But surely we need much more drastic action from our politicians to prevent the catastrophic consequences of climate change. To address the big environmental questions, environmental questions of our time, it is urgent that the damaging external effects of economic activities are fully translated into their price through taxation. Proper pricing will reduce such activities and encourage development of cleaner alternatives. Proper pricing of externalities would also mean that regular financial reporting 
would become more reflective of sustainable business activities. A kerosene tax, also very simple. Currently, my, the cost of my taxi ride to Heathrow is often more costly than the flight I take afterwards. A kerosene tax would cause the financial reports of the aviation industry to reflect the true cost of flying. A realistic carbon tax would cause the financial results of smokestack industries to reflect the true costs of their products. Stranded assets would immediately be subject to impairment under IFRS standards. Financial reporting would automatically become sustainability reporting. And that ideal world is still far away, I am afraid. And in the meantime, we'll have to make the best of the imperfect world of corporate reporting. The ISB is ready to adapt to the changing world of, world of corporate reporting by increasing the communication effectiveness of the financial statements, facilitating electronic consumption of financial data, and by promoting integrated reporting. I hope my contribution of today has made clear what the ISB can and what we cannot do to create a little bit more clarity in this imperfect world. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, it was uh, fantastic, I would say, that uh, Accountancy Europe, Mark, introduced this morning and kindly invited you to take on sustainability reporting. I think you responded very clearly. That's not our core expertise, and you call on the public authorities to actually take on that, uh, that role for further harmonization. At the same time, uh, two things came to my mind. First is expertise can always be hired, so that's shouldn't be a boundary in itself. Uh, but the other is, uh, the ISB, I think, is, is may, uh, maybe um, the, amongst the most well-known, if not the most well-known uh, leading organization in really setting standards. So the question that came to my mind is, even if you don't have the expertise and there are others in the field, wouldn't the ISB be the one to, to if it be only an, uh, play a coordinating role, how would, you, how would you see that, if you would be invited for that? <coughs> Well I, s hmm. well, I would first have to see the invitation, but... I think we do, we, 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 we do our best to help coordinating uh, in the CRD. Uh, uh, we'll uh, tell a, a little bit uh, more about that. Uh, but... Yeah. I Maybe don't know. something to think of. Well, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, just hiring in some expertise, this is not so easy. Um, um, uh, you know, it changes the whole culture of your organization. Mm. Uh, I, uh, we have the, uh, the, the... Ian, what was the name of that carbon reporting initiative uh, this, uh, across the road from, from us? I think they have more... CDP. CDP. They have more uh, employees than we do, doing just carbon reporting. So you, easily you would uh, create a monstrously big uh, organization with a total lack of focus. And I do not think it is very um, uh, plausible that um, a lot of sustainability reporting and ESG reporting is firmly entrenched in the political field, like gen gender diversity reporting. Is that something that public authorities are going to ask these ISB, could you please coordinate that for us? I don't think that's mm. very likely. It's already firmly embedded in the political do uh, domain, where probably it should be. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, the likely uh, organization to try to uh, harmonize that. Good. Thank you very much. And watch your postdoc for that invitation. Huh? Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you very much.